Good morning, KCC. Thank you so much for joining us uh, online. Uh, if you're catching us live, if maybe you're catching us in the evening, uh, we're really excited you're with us. Why don't you uh, join us in worship? If you want to sit, stand, whatever you're comfortable with, uh, we've got some songs, so why don't you join us?
and all of my devotion. And now there's nothing in this world that could ever satisfy.
Well, good morning. I don't know if you had a chance, but you might want to, before you hear this message, go back and listen to last week's message on gratitude. Scotty did an amazing job, and I don't want to cover territory that he already has, but we consider gratitude such an important thing that uh, we've taken two weeks for it. And so I want to share a little bit about it. We're doing the series Bounce, and so we're talking about bouncing back from the pandemic or bouncing back from being away from work or your family or anything like that as the world returns to the new normal. What we want to be is good people, and we want to be people that know God and hear from him. And so this is going to be a very practical message. We're going to talk about gratitude, and I'm going to talk about about six different ways that it comes from. And uh, Scotty did a great job in talking about the scripture, about the Bible, and how it talks to gratitude, and what God thinks of gratitude, and the power of gratitude. I'm going to deal a little bit more with that, and I'll allude to a couple of the passages that uh, Scotty spoke on. Um, But today is going to be an addendment to last week's message as we add to it, and we talk about gratitude. First of all, gratitude is the key to happiness. Scotty talked about that last week. Happy people are not grateful. Grateful people are happy. Okay? And so gratitude is absolutely essential if you're going to live a happy life. And so you need to find gratitude. I talked a, a couple weeks ago about my, uh, my friend whose father was uh, who, who really growing, raising his kids declared war on fairness in favor of gratitude. And so if his kids were whining, they said, you know, oh, he got to sit in the chair last time. I need to sit in the chair of, you know, whatever chair has the best view of the TV. Their father would go, both of you get out of the chair. I'm going to sit in the chair. He said, you're not grateful for what you have. You're going to be resentful. Life isn't fair. And so I want you to be grateful for what you have. And so if you get the chair, be grateful. If you don't get the chair, be grateful. Gratitude is more important than fairness. And so today, we want to talk about gratitude in that light. Denny Prager writes, Of all the characteristics needed for both a happy and morally decent life, nothing surpasses gratitude. Grateful people are happier, and grateful people are more morally decent. And this is true. I don't know if you're familiar or you think about the people in your lives, But think about the people who are grateful, those that lift others around them. You know, I I, I sometimes, you know, I'll run into someone that's really sarcastic and cynical, and they'll be really funny, you know, and, and, and I'll have a lot of laughs around them and things like that. But when I leave them, I don't necessarily feel like I've been lifted, right? But there are those people around us, when they see you, they just focus on you like you're the only person in the world, and they lift you. And people like that are rare, and they're precious, and they tend to be grateful. When I was a kid, I was a real rug rat. You know, I really was. There were five of us, single parent home. My mom worked all the time. My dad was on the road. He was a truck driver and didn't see him very much. And, you know, I kind of had my friends and stuff like that, but I was just rough around the edges. And I'll never forget, I used to walk to school every day. And uh, every once in a while, I would run into a guy. And the guy was, uh, like, I think he, he was probably about five, six years older than me. And uh, every time he saw me, he's just his face would light up, and he'd say, hey, buddy, how's it going? And I would go, good, you know, I, I'm going to school. I got to play, you were going to play soccer today. Buddy, that's great. Oh, I hope it's wonderful for you and all that. And, you know, this, this, these interactions would be like seconds. Often, I wouldn't stop. You know, we'd just go by each other. But every time I saw the guy, he lifted me. He was just such a nice guy. His face would light up, and he was just so encouraging. I'll never forget the guy. I don't know his name. I don't know much about him. Yeah, I don't know if he went on to be, you know, whatever, but that guy made my day when I was a kid, you know, because a lot of people you're around, you know, it feels like they're trying to sour milk, right? You know, they, they, they're not interested in you or they're not focused on you or they don't, you know, have anything to give you. Grateful people do. We talked about last week, we talk, uh, Scotty talked about how gratitude is also the door to God's goodness. Psalm 100 verse 4 says, always start your day and always start your prayers with thanksgiving. Psalm 100 verse 4 in another translation says, enter his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. Gratitude connects us to God. Grateful people have a window or a door into God's presence because they are lifted above the resentment and anger and muck of the world 
and they see the world differently. And because of that, their interest and their connection with God can be greater. Brennan Manning writes, the dominant characteristic of an authentic spiritual life is a gratitude that flows from trust. Not only for all the gifts that I receive from God, but by the gratitude for all the suffering. Because in that purifying experience, suffering has often been the shortest path to intimacy with God. This is a really interesting thing. If you are a grateful person, suffering often gets inverted. And... and the early church really had really grasped this because they had a pretty rough time. Like they were marked in their world. Often the government was against them. Often their brothers and sisters would turn against them. Often the nations were against them. And so those early days, they seemed to have this can-do, grateful attitude because what God had done for them, and this made them stand out like a sore thumb with the people around them. In fact, to the point where they, they actually believed that when you suffer, it's a good thing because you recognize that Jesus suffered and you get to participate in his suffering. It's not that he went looking for pain, they weren't masochistic, but that when they ran into trouble, they faced it head on and they faced it with a grateful attitude and they actually said, this suffering actually connects me to Jesus more. And I, I mean, there's documented cases of people singing while the lions, you know, where they're in the arena and the lions are coming to kill them, you know, or they got, went through horrific times where people that observed the deaths of believers in those first couple of hundred years often became believers themselves because they're saying, this person's going to their deaths and they have joy and gratitude. John Ortberg writes, the only true and lasting inspiration for life is a genuine love of God and a submitted gratitude that I get to be a part of his redemptive quest. Grateful people can see the big picture. So what does grief, gratitude does? First thing, gratitude brings freedom. Gratitude is what we radiate when we experience grief, grace. And the soul is made to run on grace the way a 747 runs on rocket fuel. Gratitude is actually the same word that's used for grace in the, Old, in the New Testament was gratitude. Gratitude is the expression of grace. And so I need to recognize the good things in my life. I often talk, that it's, it's one of the strangest things we live in such a world where there's so much resentment. We have more, we have it better than people like have in history, like always, like you will, you, the life you're experiencing, the things you have access to, the health care, the food, the diet, all these kind of things, nobody's ever had it this good. What is we, what do we have? We have a lot of bun- discontent, angry, bitter people. And, and I've had the privilege at times to travel to places in the world where there's abject poverty. And some of those people who have had nothing are the most joyous, complete, wonderful people. And the only thing they had was each other, or they had, you know, a ball of tape they used as a soccer ball, and they radiated joy. They smiled more than people I would ever see in in our world today. It's an absolutely amazing thing. How can we be resentful? Polio's been wiped out. You know, some people say, well, you know, we've had the, the coronavirus, and this has been horrible and everything like that. But yeah, what a, you know, if you're going to have a plague, it's a pretty good one. And I'm, I'm not poo-pooing if you've lost a relative or whatever. That's horrible. And, and there are people who died, and this is a very serious thing. But the bubonic plague, which went through the Middle East, wiped out between 50 and 70% of the population. It killed whole towns. You know, as far as plagues go, I think we got off pretty easy on this one. We need to take it seriously, but we got off easy. You never hear anybody say, thank you, Lord, that we only had COVID. Yet a grateful person can find the best in the darkest circumstances. It brings freedom. As John Orberg says, it's the same way that grace, it operates as a 747 runs on rocket fuel. Gratitude brings freedom. Scotty had alluded to it, but we talk in the Old Testament about the story of Jonah. Jonah was a man who was a spokesman for God. They called them prophets in those days. And God asked Jonah to go to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was a capital, actually the administrative capital of the, uh, the empire of the Assyrians. The Assyrians were the Nazis of the old world. 
They really were. They were the most horrible people. Um, when the Assyrian Empire fell, and like this country was strong for like 1,200 years. I mean, the Assyrians, they were in power a long time, and they controlled a wide region of the known world for, for many hundreds of years. And everybody hated them. Because the Assyrians, when they conquered you, they didn't just conquer you. They humiliated you. They did torturous, horrible things to people. And if anybody dared to rebel against them, nobody got out. They would slaughter men, women, and children. They were just, they were really, really horrible people. And God said to Jonah, go to Nineveh and preach. And tell them, you know, unless they change their ways and they repent, their, their city's going to be destroyed. And Jonah goes, no, not on my watch. So he gets in a boat and he goes away and he runs as far, he goes the opposite direction. He goes to Tarshish, which is in Spain. He was supposed to go the other way. And uh, while he's there, there's a huge storm and, and uh, he gets in a conversation with the sailors and you know, they're like, why is God putting us through this? We're gonna lose our lives and that. And Jonah says, well, it might be this, you know? And uh, he says, uh, you know, the only way to solve this is to throw me in the ocean. Jonah would rather die than go to the Assyrians. And, and these guys, you got to give them credit. They did not want to do that. But finally, you know, Jonah said, no, no, throw me in. So they picked him up and threw him over and the, the, the waters became calm. And Jonah sank down into the water and was enveloped by a huge fish. And he was in the stomach of that fish. Now... This is not a place where you would think, I'm going to be really grateful. It really isn't. But Jonah knew something that probably all of us could learn. In the belly of that whale, in the deep, dark, horrible depths, he knew God could still hear. And so he called out to God, and he committed his ways to God. And it said, God vomited Jonah from the fish onto the land. And Jonah went on to preach in Nineveh, and there was a great change in that city, and Jonah again would struggle with all kinds of resentment. But God was teaching him a lesson when he reached those horrible people. Gratitude brings freedom. The discipline of gratitude is the explicit effort to acknowledge that all that I am and have is given to me as a gift of love, a gift to be celebrated with joy. What do you have that you are grateful for? If you can't think of it, then here's a good exercise for you. My wife and I do it, and, and we do it from time to time on holidays and high days and all that kind of stuff where we will write what we're grateful for, and we keep it in a box, and you know sometimes we pull it out and we'll look through it and think of all the things we're grateful for. In fact, my wife had this really great thing. One time when the boys were younger, you know, he got uh, them and some friends they had and all that to write on these hearts these messages of why you appreciate or why you're grateful to each person. And I still got a bunch of those stuck to my office door. They're wonderful. You know, my little boys in their writing with the P's backwards and all that kind of, dad made me laugh and, you know, dad's a funny guy and I love dad because of this. And, you know, it just makes your heart bleed, right? It's a choice. So gratitude is a daily choice. Each day when you get up, when a person doesn't have gratitude, something is missing in his or her humanity. A person can almost be defined by his or her attitude towards gratitude. Eli Weasel, Eli Lisa Weasel wrote, gratitude is a daily choice. And so if I'm gonna be grateful, I, I, as I was talking about a couple of weeks ago, it's easy to be resentful. Everybody can be resentful. All you gotta do is do nothing and get resentful. The hard part is being a grateful person to have an attitude that you're gonna look at the good and dispel with the bad. And so, what do you have in your life you're grateful for? If you can't instantly think of 10 things, then chances are you're not living in the same country I am because there's so much for us to be grateful for. Have you been in a war? You know, chances are today you haven't. Well, congratulations, you are like 1% of 1% of the his, his people in history who hasn't been through a war. You know, have you, have you, uh, you know, lost a child. Some of you have, and it's incredibly painful. But most of us, you know, our kids are born healthy. That's something to be grateful for. Do you have enough to eat? The ironic thing in our world is most of us are eating them ourselves to death. We eat so much that it actually affects our health. Do you have enough to eat? Do you get a good night's sleep? Do you have a job? Do you have a spouse? Do you have children? Do you have parents? Do you have a friend? There's so many reasons to be grateful for. 
and I haven't even begun to talk about the things we're grateful for from God. That God knows me and loves me and sees me and offers me salvation. There is so much to be grateful for. Second instance, and this again one Scotty was talking about, was found in the book of Acts. He talked about how Paul and Silas, that they, uh, they dealt with this lady and, and uh, she was calling after them and she had an evil spirit in them. So they drove this evil spirit out and so she was made well and it was a wonderful thing. And you think that'd be a good thing. But in that town, they actually made a lot of money from this girl, from her, you know, predicting people's futures and doing things. And so what they did is they got these sticks, rods, really, you know, if you, like a broomstick. And they beat them both, you know, to a pulp. And then they took them and they threw them in the prison. In those days, prisons were, basically they dig a hole in the ground and put a wall around it and a roof, and that was it. And uh, there would be rats and bugs and all kinds of horrible, it would be damp and, and smelly down there. And they put them in stocks, which mean they would lock up, they locked up their legs, so they had to sit in a painful position all night. Now, I don't know about you, but I would have been maybe a little resentful. You know, like, here I am doing God's work, and you know, this is not the Hilton. You know, I'm not really getting a good, you know, feedback on this whole ministry thing. What did these turkeys do? They started singing. They started singing um, praise to God and, and all that. And it says that the prisoners in the prison, so they weren't alone in there, were listening to them. Okay? Now, here's a wonderful thing. All of a sudden, it said there was a great earthquake, so the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were open and everybody's chains were loosed. And so all of a sudden this is open. And, and what Scotty talked about last week, I mean, let's think about this for a minute. The, um, the guard in the prison, they would have somebody who's in charge of that prison. And the way that they, you know, because people could be bought off, right? They didn't want anybody to be bribed. And so they had this rule. If you're in charge of the prison. If the prisoners escape, we kill you. Probably a great way to ensure job security, right? <laughs> And so these guys were responsible for it. And when the prison opened, like quite literally the walls opened so anybody could walk out of there that wanted to. So this guy takes out his sword to kill himself because he can only imagine what these townspeople are going to do to him, the prisoners have escaped. But instead, Paul calls out. He said, no, 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 don't do it. We are here. We are all here. Now, the question I have is, why do the other prisoners not like break and run? What kept them in the prison? Well, here's the thing. They recognized that freedom wasn't outside the prison. Freedom was inside with these two men whose response to pain and suffering was gratitude. Wow. That's an amazing, amazing thing. You know, there's a number of passages where someone comes to Jesus, really needs something. And uh, they come to him and they're grateful and they're humble and they ask nicely and they respond well and all that. And Jesus often said to them, congratulations, your faith has made you well or your faith has made you whole. Now, this is a word, most of the time when you see the Bible, what it says in English is what it said in the original languages and stuff. But there's a little more to it. Whole and well, there was a word that Jesus used for that that meant um, just all general, all around um, prosperity in your life. And quite that literally what he meant is not only your body healed, your soul is healed. Your hurts are healed. Your sins are forgiven. You are made whole. And, and, and you know, if you grasp that, sometimes horrible circumstances can actually have the opposite effect. So let's move on. How do we be grateful? For choosing gratitude means letting go of something else. Gratitude and grudges cannot coexist. Let me repeat that. Gratitude and grudges cannot coexist. If you're going to carry a grudge, it's going to be impossible to be grateful. If you're going to choose to be grateful, it's pretty hard to carry a grudge, right? Choosing gratitude means letting go of something else. So we let go of grudges, disappointments, complaining to receive freedom that comes from gratitude. As I was talking a couple of weeks ago, we choose to say the right things. Paul and Silas could have complained. Probably would have been a little justified as some complaining. You know, they've been beaten within an inch of their lives. They're sitting there in a dirty, dark, dank prison. They're locked in a way so that they can't sleep and they're in pain and all that. What are these guys doing? They're singing. They're singing. Why? Because they couldn't 
no matter what happened to them, it couldn't take away their gratitude. A grudge and a gratitude cannot coexist. So what's wrong has been done to you? What baggage do you carry around? Unforgiveness, all those kind of things. And you may say, well, you don't understand how I've been hurt. Well, probably not, but we've all been hurt. Some of us a lot worse than others. And so the challenge I have for you is, do you want to stay hurt? Do you want to give your life over to complaining, resentment, and victimhood? Is that, that really, I mean, you may feel morally righteous as a victim, but do you really want to stay there? What do you, you know, do, do you actually believe that God has more for you in this life? And do you actually believe by a change in attitude you can actually change your future? You can. It's true. Worse people than you have done it. Um, a lot of us have heard the, the song Amazing Grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. The saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was a slave, but now I'm free. The guy who wrote that was a slave trader. A slave trader that his job was to go to Africa, you know, grab people, abduct them, kidnap them, tie them up in a ship, sail them across the ocean, and to sell them in American markets. It was a horrible trade. Often they would lose 30% of the people that were on that boat. They would die of sickness and in filth and in horrible situations. And this man was known as an evil, horrible, resentful man. What happened? One day he met God. Someone shared the message to him and he was transformed. He left the slave trade. He became a different person. He was the kind of person that people looked at it and go, how did he come so far from there to here? And he wrote those songs, Amazing Grace. His resentment, his anger, his bitterness, and his evil was turned to gratitude when he found Jesus Christ. Melody Beattie writes, Gratitude unlocks the fullness of life. It turns what we have into enough and more. It turns denial into acceptance, chaos into order, confusion to clarity. It can turn a meal into a feast, a house into a home, and a stranger to a friend. Gratitude gives you power. So the question I have for you today, you've heard two messages on it because this is important. Are you or can you see yourself becoming a grateful person? The first step is accepting the grace that God has extended to you. When I was 11 years old, I made a decision to become a follower of Jesus Christ. In fact, maybe some of you watching the video have at our church or somewhere else heard the message of God's love and accepted God's message of grace. Do you know how audacious God is in his grace? Well, the first thing he does when he offers us salvation is he offers to wipe away all the evil and resentment and horrible things of our past and the evil we've done and make us clean and new. Isn't that wonderful? You know, how many of us would like a fresh start? It says in the Bible, if anybody's in Christ, you're a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. That's amazing. Isn't that great? But there's more. Not only does that, the audacity of God's grace is, not only does he forgive our sins, he adopts us into his family. I don't know what your family situation was growing up, but there's no greater family than the body of Christ. And God says, when you become my child, I adopt you, I will direct you, I will help you, I will give you strength, and I will take up a house inside you. I will live with you and will give you the power and grace and love you need that can overcome any hurdle. T.S. Lewis once wrote, if we have a need or an ache that cannot be met in this world, could it be possible that we need the help of something from another world? Well, that other world is God. Augustine talked about a God-shaped hole in all our hearts. So God not only forgives us of our sin and makes us a new person, he adopts us into his family. That's audacious, but there's more. Not only does he do that, you know, I mean, does he forgive us and give us a new family and we can join the church of Jesus Christ and, and, and we have brothers and sisters who are people, maybe they're strangers to us. But here's another audacious thing. He rewards us for stuff that we should have done in the first place. So let me get this straight. You know, God only forgives me for everything I've done. Not only does he adopt me in his family,
But when I do stuff for him, when I serve him and love others and share his message and, and minister, Jesus said, you won't even give a cup of water you won't be rewarded for. He rewards us. Now that is audacious. If you cannot look that in the eye and go, I am grateful, then I don't know what you want God to do for you. You talk about suffering, Jesus faced suffering. You talk about death, Jesus died for your sins. You talk about wanting to overcome this world, Jesus said, I have overcome the world. You talk about the expectation that someday we will die and that life seems meaningless and all that. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me, though they were dead, they shall live. There is nothing that life or death can throw at you that God isn't going to go, I got this. And if you haven't accepted him and he hasn't, you haven't become a follower of Jesus Christ, maybe this message is for you. Maybe you're starting to get it and you go, not only I get it, I want it. And so I'm gonna say a little prayer. And what I want you to do is say this prayer with me if you wanna become a follower of Christ. And I'm gonna front end load it by telling you the, what you should do after that. You should join a church. I happen to have one handy here that you can join or you'll really like. You need to read the Bible every day. You don't have to get like your old grandmother's Bible. There's Bibles that have today's English that are really helpful. I, I recommend the New Living Transformation or the New International Version, but there's all kinds of good ones, the New English Bible, all different ones like that. It's one out now called the Passion Bible. I understand it's a very good translation. Get that Bible and then start to read in the second, but the second, last third of that Bible, there are four books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I would challenge you to start reading those books. The easiest one to start is Mark, but they're all about the life of Jesus. They all run sequentially, and they all have different things to say about what it was like to live with Jesus, and you can learn who you're following, and you can learn to tune yourself to his voice. The second thing is pray. Um, talk to God and listen to him. Tell him what you need. Tell him what hurts you. Thank him for what he's given you. Be grateful. And start a conversation with God. You may seem really funny. You know, it may seem really odd at first, but I challenge you to do that. It is natural. Science has proven that something happens when people pray that doesn't when they don't. It's a really interesting phenomenon. They talked about people that are in hospitals that are sick. And if someone was praying for them, they have actually documented this. The person has a greater chance of recovery. I'll have a, a better transition from sickness into health and we'll have a better circumstance. We'll actually lift up their mood and all those things. There's power in prayer. And I invite you to start a conversation with God. Join a church, read your Bible, and learn to pray. And then as you learn about Jesus, share it with other people. It's too good to keep to yourself. And live a life of gratitude. Envelop the attitude that there's lots I don't have. There's lots that's happened to me I don't like. But there's so much more that I can be grateful for, ultimately in this world, but especially in the world to come. So let's pray. Father, I ask that uh, today for anyone here who doesn't know Jesus Christ, that they would hear the message of your grace and they would say, I want to become a follower of Jesus Christ. So I give my life to God. I ask you to take the broken pieces of my heart and my life, the evil I've done, the sin I've caused, the hurts I carry, all these things, and I want you to package them up, God, and take care of them. Wipe the slate clean and make me a new person. And then, God, I commit to live for you I'm gonna take my direction from you. I'm gonna study in that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, those books, I'm gonna learn about Jesus and learn to listen to him and follow him and to do the things that he asked me to do and live the life that he asked me to live and that I could become more and more like him each day. I will find a group of believers, people who love Jesus and together grow with them and help them and love them and in turn be loved by them. I will pray each day, I will talk to God and listen to what he has to say to me. I make this commitment today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for being with us. Remember, be grateful. You cannot hold a grudge and be grateful at the same time. God bless you. We'll see you next week. You hold my air 
What is it? It's back. 